Blog Talk Radio. Hello, folks. How are you doing? It's Danny Tisdale, and I'm glad you're here because you are here with us for the Danny Tisdale Show. I hope you love it. I love it, uh, and um, and I'm glad you are here with us today. And uh, we, we're going to, of course, have another great guest to talk about some of the great things that are going on in and around Harlem, but mostly in the Harlem, in the world of Harlem for the most part. And you know what I love to do is to give you a few heads up on on what's going on and and what's been happening. We just did a post on uh, um, uh, Harlem Rep uh, Espelot's uh, release regarding uh, the Harlem District Report uh, regarding U.S. Postal Service, how things can be improved, uh, some of the things that are in the works for the improvement. Uh, we also, um, I, I, just to, to be on notice, there's the uh, uh, Harlem and some of the uh, uh, outskirts of Central Park uh, has some uh, um, what they're calling uh, zombie virus, believe it or not, of, uh, for raccoons that have died in the Harlem area around 102nd Street and 110th Street. So uh, be aware and uh, stay aware of what's going on, of course, by coming back to Harlem World, because you know, we're going to have all the information that you need to stay on top of what's going on uh, in and around Harlem. And with that being said, we want to get right to our guests And our guest is Chelsea Lynn Rutter. She is a native of Rochester Hills, Michigan, and a former Miss Michigan Teen USA. Uh, She is the new director of Alzheimer's uh, and the Alzheimer's Association of New York City chapter. She served as communications director and press secretary for NYC Health and Hospitals, the largest health care system in the nation. Uh, Ms. Rudder is an author of Lady Like Lessons, and hopefully we have enough time to talk about that a little later on, and has acted as a spokesperson for health care, labor, political, and government organizations. She is a former executive director of New York City Council's Black Latino Asian Caucus. Uh, she is a member of WN. E.T. Channel 13 Community Advisory Board and is appointee to the Board of Trustees Education Committee for the local PBS affiliate, uh, local affiliate. Ms. Rudder also holds an MS in Global Affairs from New York University and a BA in Communications and Political Science from Pace University. I'm going to take a deep breath and uh, say hello to Chelsea. How are you doing? I am doing well. Thank you for such a spectacular introduction. I I can barely remember some of the things you mentioned, but um, I'm really glad that you brought them up. Um, And just to clarify, I'm the director of communications here at the Alzheimer's Association New York City chapter. I I don't want my boss thinking I'm trying to take his job. (laughs) Well, we don't want that to happen. There's been uh, uh, rumors going on, but I haven't heard that one. So, uh, uh, and I don't want to cause one. So, Thank you again for for being on the show, and I want to get right into it. And first of all, congratulate you on your new job of Director of Communications. And, you know, Chelsea, to get right into it, uh, who has been your inspiration in your life to, you know, kind of uh, uh, inspire you to do the things that you've been doing? Well, again, thank you, Danny, so much for inviting me to be a part of the show. And um, to get to your question, the first person I think of every morning and the person who's gotten me through in my life is my mother. She has really inspired me and um, helped me to really push through and meet so many of my goals. And one of the things that I think about most is – you know, I really have a personal connection to Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, mm. When I was going into my junior year of high school, my father suffered a major stroke. And for the next nine years, my mother was his primary caretaker, and she continued to work mm. full time. She was in education. Wow. She was a middle school counselor, and she ran an after school program. And she was able to manage both her professional life and her home life with my father being sick. Um, And a couple of years after he had the stroke, he started to develop uh, uh, vascular dementia, 
fact, uh, um, related to this that he suffered over the, over the course of the time period when he was ill. So uh, as a result of just sort of the superhuman things that I'm able to do and the fact that she's never given up, always pushed forward, she's really been my biggest inspiration. She's always championed me. Uh, any goal thing that I that was positive, she always said she would try to support me and try to make sure I had a way to do it. So uh, I really can say nothing uh, than great things about my mother, and I know I'm really fortunate to have her. That's uh, fantastic, and and nothing against dads, but you know this is a question I love asking guests when I speak to, and you know I'm going to say it 90% of the time, you know moms get the props, you know in this situation, uh, dads. I know you're doing great things, and I know dads do great things, but I'm just making a. <clears throat> A, a little insight there on kind of right. a, a trend that happens in this conversation. So not, not to take anything away from dads, but moms, you know, much love to you. Uh, uh, you're always doing a great job. Um, of course. And, and that's, and that's great to to hear. And, you know, I, I I'm going to go right to the next one, uh, Chelsea and ask you, you know, cause I, I know that we've worked together uh, on the communication side, Harlem World Magazine and New York Health and Hospitals. And I think that that's where uh, 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 I, I first kind of e met you. What made yes, you that's definitely where leap? we first met. That's right. That's right. Uh, what made you take the leap from uh, NYC Health and Hospitals to uh, Alzheimer's, to the Alzheimer's Association? Was it because of that history you talked about, or was this just a great job opportunity? Well, it was a combination of both. Uh, You know, it was time for me to move forward with some of my own professional goals. I still, Mm. of course, love and identify with NYC Health and Hospitals. They have maintained um, health care for all regardless of ability to pay, regardless of national origin or immigration status. And that um, concept is something that I will always strongly believe in and identify Mm. with. But in terms of my own professional goals, I really wanted to move forward to a position where I would be able to focus more on overall communication strategy. Uh, As I mentioned, I was a press secretary at NYC Health and Hospitals, and so that's how we initially connected. I was always pitching you things, hoping that we could get something (laughs) up on Harlem World because I know that's where so many people go for great and important information. So um, I really love media strategy. I love working with reporters. They know about um, awesome community resources available. So I just wanted to sort of take things to the next level in terms of next my level. own career development. Um, and so when I heard about this position at the Alzheimer's Association, you know, of course, I thought about the personal connection that I have to dementia, um, you know, with my mm-hmm. father, um, you know, suffering after he had several strokes. And mm-hmm. I recognize how challenging it can be for families because in you look face there's a lot of questions. And one of the things that appealed to me about the Alzheimer's Association is that we have many great programs and events that are available free of charge to the community. Um, a lot of that is due to the fact that the state of New York has a great grant for Alzheimer's programming. And as a result, wow. we are able to offer the community um, stage support group programming. People who are in early stages with mild symptoms of dementia or Alzheimer's, we really want to make sure people uh, at that point, do not withdraw from the community, do not withdraw from social interaction. So we have programs where you can take a dance class, uh, do a photography course, uh, Mm. some of the recent things that we've had, just to make sure that people stay connected, realize that they can do skills, be a vibrant and important community. And so with that, really, those really great resources that the nation field, I say so I could take my talent really things people know about the great things that we have here well that's fantastic and and uh chelsea i want to apologize because uh, it seems that we're having uh some technical difficulties i don't know if uh it's on my end that we're going in and out or on your end so i'm just going to shift a few things around here i'm not going to disconnect us but hopefully in shifting and moving uh the, the connection's a little better um 
And uh, uh, I, I completely hear you uh, when you talk about, you know, the move from NYC health hospitals to Alzheimer's because uh, I, I think I'd emailed you or, or uh, I, I think it was the email that we are at least once a month reporting on seniors uh, who are uh, in Harlem or uptown and, uh, you know, Washington Heights or Inwood and, you know, the police department, their families are looking for these seniors who have, you know, walked off and, you know, not come home or not come home yet. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, of course, not a family member of mine or any of the staff, but uh, it's it's something that hit home hits home with us each time it happens. And uh, do you, do you see any future policy issue regarding uh, Alzheimer's and health uh, hitting our way, or are we or is that a long way down the road? No, most definitely. So one of the pillars that we focus on here at the Alzheimer's Association is policy, is trying to work with our elected officials and influence right. them to make sure that not only do we have policies in place that help people who have been impacted by Alzheimer's and other dementias, but also that adequate resources in terms of funding go into research so we can one day right. find a cure for Alzheimer's. So it's interesting that you mention this because just yesterday the House of Representatives passed the Palliative Care and Hospice Education and Training Act. And oh. that's a mouthful, but it's a really important piece of legislation because under a unanimous vote, which you know is very difficult to have a very. unanimous and bipartisan support amongst the, at the wow. House level these days, uh, they were able to advance legislation which will improve access to quality hospice and palliative care. And hmm. of course, palliative in hospice care focuses on ma managing and easing symptoms, reducing pain and stress and uh, discomfort levels. And this is really important because among seniors in hospice care, nearly one in every five has a primary hospice diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Mm. So this is something mm. that really impacts um, people who have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and dementia. And also, you know, it really impacts the families. You know, as I right. mentioned you know, when a family member, especially a close family member, has a diagnosis like this, there's a lot that goes on within the whole family. You don't want to see your loved one confused, upset, or, agitated. Yeah. And so with this program being in place, it's really going to help to alleviate, um, you know, some of those symptoms and make sure that the appropriate education and training is in place. So, of course, you know, we've only gotten it past one part of the legislature, which, you know, mm -hmm. again, in this day and age is kind of difficult. So, you know, we are hoping but to eventually forward. get it. Yeah. Exactly. It's a step forward. So the next step is the Senate. And then, you know, what happens after that? We've got to get a signature. But we'll take each step at a time. And, and like I mentioned, it's really encouraging that this had bipartisan support. It was unanimously approved. And I uh, just wanted to mention that uh, Congressman Espiat was one of the co-sponsors on this bill. So um, oh, he was firmly in step with us in making sure that this legislation moved forward. So um, Harlem's congressman is, is right on track in terms of understanding the importance of, of this type of legislation in terms of how it impacts the community. Yeah, and I, I uh, uh, again, uh, he has done incredible work. You are uh, doing great work. And, uh, you know, I, I just hope that uh, there's more of that kind of quote unquote, reaching across the aisles where, uh, you know, uh, our electeds can work together in the best interests of, you know, those who elect them, uh, you know, no matter what party they are a part of, you know, there's so much work that needs to be done. It's, uh, it's just incredible, you know, um, and I, I know you know that. And I, I'm just going to take a quick station ID and let our listeners know that they're listening to the Danny Tisdale Show, and it's on Harlem World Radio. Uh, and, of course, I'm Danny Tisdale, and we're going to get right back to it uh, here, and we are talking to Chelsea Lynn Rutter. She is the new communications director at the Alzheimer's Association and uh, just uh, giving her her props for doing great work that she's done in Harlem, and now she gets to do work uh, uh, locally, regionally, and nationally, and uh, 
Uh, I'm pretty excited about it because uh, uh, we know from working with her that she does great work and what she says is what she does. And, uh, you know, I, I prepare to Chelsea with my, my, my crystal ball question. So I wanted to ask you, as we talk about health care, you know, I, I, you seem to be an optimist, but I'm going to ask you anyway, when you look at your national crystal ball, do you see – rather blurry or clear any kind of national health care kicking in. Uh, we just had a, a, a positive vote by, you know, both parties regarding, you know, Alzheimer's policy. What, how do you feel about national health care? Well, like you said, that's a challenging question considering the political times that we're in. But I will yeah. say one of the things that really attracted me to this position is that Alzheimer's, dementia, the care for the people both diagnosed and for the families, it's really a nonpartisan issue. Right. And uh, as we right. mentioned, the passage through the House of the um, Palliative Care and Hospice, Hospice Education Act is really uh, emblematic of the fact that people can come to Together and work across the aisle mm -hmm. on important issues. Now, of course, this I'm talking about one specific issue around Alzheimer's and dementia care, but right. health care is something that we all need. I'm still <laughs> not so sure how it continuously becomes so politicized because uh, at the end of the day, um, everyone needs to have quality health care and everyone deserves to have access to quality health care. It really shouldn't be a question of what you can pay for and what you can't afford. Um, you know, as I mentioned, one of the things that really attracted me to the Alzheimer's Association is that with our New York City chapter and all five boroughs, we offer right. support programming, um, informational programming, counseling, and also social engagement programs, all free of charge. And as far oh. as I'm concerned, that's really the way it should be. We have right. a great grant through the state of New York that supports our programming because regardless of if anyone has private insurance, public insurance, et cetera, when you have somebody who has been diagnosed with a long-term disease, you know, I mentioned my father was in declining mm -hmm. health over the course of nine years, and we were really fortunate to have excellent health insurance. But my mom mentioned to me that just her overall household bills were more expensive because of my father being in ill health. You know, you don't necessarily think about it, but when you have somebody right. who is homebound for the most part and in uh, a challenging health circumstance, household bills like toilet paper expenses and things of that nature go up because someone is always right. there. And if somebody right. is ill, they're oftentimes using, you know, household items more than others. So it's sort of beyond what your standard health insurance pays for that goes up in terms of expenses. So the Alzheimer's Association being able to offer free programming, free events, um, free engagement activities for people who have been diagnosed and their loved ones is really, really important. And just to go a little in further than that, uh, you know, I actually previously worked on the Medicaid expansion program for New York State uh, with a large hospital system. And there uh, is, it's a really large and complicated process, but one thing that I think is really great is that, Medic, uh, is that New York State did take advantage of the Medicaid waiver program and did expand Medicaid so that more people who are the working poor had access to Medicaid because previously there were a lot of different conditions under which you were allowed to be on the public health insurance and the situation with the Medicaid expansion in New York State allowed those conditions to uh, to be augmented so that more people could mm -hmm. have access to Medicaid and have access to right. free health care if they lived in the state of New York. So if I had it my way, that's the way that it would be. People who need health care, which is every single one of us needs to maintain good health <laughs> and certainly right. manage any chronic conditions that we have. So that's what it would be if it were up to me. I don't know what's going to happen down in Washington, but if I have my way and have the opportunity to influence things, that's certainly what I will lobby for. And uh, that makes complete sense. And, uh, you know, I just – you know, Chelsea keeps saying to myself that, you know, one of these days, you know, and maybe it's more decade than a day uh, that we'll wake up and uh, we'll be looking back when we have national health care and look at each other in shock that, you know, in the 1980s, the, uh, well, not up until whatever year it is that, you know, we have national health care. I, I think we'll look back and 
uh, some embarrassment that we did not uh, make this investment in uh, Americans ac- uh, across the nation to, you know, uh, uh, give them national health care, give us national health care. I-, I just think it's something we're just, you know, not seeing the big picture on. You know, uh, we're missing it completely. So I- I- I'm definitely on board with what you're saying, and it makes complete sense. Um, and uh, I wanted to uh, uh, go a little bit into your uh, book, Ladylike Lessons, and also oh, sure. talk about, um, you know, uh, the the parents who are listening to our show. Uh, eight, 35% of our uh, listeners are parents, and uh, they may have a little one who may want to follow in your footsteps, your communication pumps. You know, what advice do you give some of those uh, parents who uh, are listening to you and and hear how passionate you are? And uh, what advice do you have for those parents with their kids who, you know, uh, who want to kind of be like you? (laughs) <laughs> well, it's extraordinarily flattering to think that someone would want to be like me. So I, I appreciate that sentiment. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I was really fortunate to have really supportive, loving parents who involved me in a lot of different activities from an early age based upon the things that I really expressed interest in. You know, I, you mentioned uh, I was a former Miss Michigan Teen USA, and I grew right. up dancing and doing pageants and just performing all over the place. And my parents really made a lot of sacrifices to make sure I had a lot of opportunities um, to pursue my interests at a very high level um, from a very early age. And, you know, another thing that my family always invested in um, were were education, travel, and other learning opportunities. I Mm. always tell people I was super fortunate. I, I went to a public high school. I grew up about 30 minutes north of Detroit, but I had the opportunity to travel to Europe and abroad three times while I was in high school. Um, We had teachers that were apparently willing to take a big risk by taking teenagers (laughs) overseas. Um, That's right. But, you know, I I really – developed a very strong appreciation for the rest of the world, for international events and politics as a result of those early travel opportunities. So I would encourage um, any young person and any parent to take advantage of those opportunities as you come to. You know, maybe it doesn't seem like the right time. Maybe it's going to be kind of expensive. Maybe you have to work a little extra and rub a few extra pennies together. But when you get those opportunities, really try to take advantage of them because, I know from um, the times that I was able to travel and to even live abroad briefly when I was in college, those experiences really shaped um, my outlook going forward. Um, Secondarily, I would say um, try to get into a situation where you can have as many sort of work experiences when you're in high school Mm. and college to try out different fields. Because I always knew I was interested in going into communications, generally speaking, and I initially did some internships in broadcast journalism and in reporting, and I also did an internship in um, at the New York City Council, and I was interested in politics and government. And, um, you know, thought that maybe it was something I would get involved with later in life. Um, You know, I came from a background where my parents definitely voted, but they weren't politically active, you know, involved in political clubs and such. Mm -hmm. But my experience my senior year in college, um, interning with former city council member Robert Jackson, really opened up a lot of doors for me and paved the way for me to get really heavily involved in New York City government and politics from a very young age. So try to have as many of those immersive work experiences as you can, even if it seems a lot, a little outside of your specific goal at the time, it might open mm-hmm. up something new to you that you hadn't thought as much about. And um, either way, you know, my mom will always say, um, you know, if it's something positive, if it's educational, then you should just go with it and, and stick it out. So, um, you know, be open go to mom. new opportunities. Yeah. And, um, and try to, to really immerse yourself in, in experiences while you have the chance. Um, because you, things are, are not always there. So when the opportunity comes up, I, I encourage people to really take it. Uh, that is uh, great, great, great advice. And, uh, you know, I'm going to spring a question on you I didn't prepare you for. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> running for office? You thought about running no. for office at all? or? Uh... 
You know, it's funny that you ask because I have, Uh-oh. of course, been so encouraged by, um, you know, seeing so many young women in particular run for office after the um, you know, right. most recent presidential election. Uh, it's something <laughs> yes, that, of course, has crossed my mind, but um, I have no immediate plans. I'll, I'll put it that way. <laughs> but, but, um, but you're it's not definitely... saying no to the possibility. Definitely not. I'm completely open to okay. the possibility. Of, and <laughs> I, I, I will say that, you know, one role that I have always just loved because um, my uh, my soror, uh, C. Virginia Fields, uh, is Manhattan Borough President, was really one of the first elected officials that I oh, met yeah. and got to know. Um, oh, so I, I've always thought that I would love to be Manhattan Borough President, but that's probably far off in my future. <laughs> um, but oh. but no, no immediate plans, no announcements. You heard it here but first, I, first folks. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but Danny, I promise you, I will break the news on Harlem World Magazine when and if I make that announcement. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I'm not holding you to it, but I'm holding you to it. <clears throat> uh, yeah, no, you you can hold me to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's fa- fantastic. Uh, I, I think uh, you do a great job, and I. You know, I, I'm old school. I don't care, you know, about the party. I just care about, you know, what you're going to do and what you say you're going to do. So uh, it, it sounds fantastic. I try to encourage everyone to run for office and contribute to uh, our wonderful democracy as much as possible. And uh, Miss Rudder, the clock is ticking already. We're already down to three minutes, and I've got two questions for you. One, do you have a favorite place in Harlem? And if you do, what is it? I absolutely have a favorite place in Harlem. It's the Apollo Theater. And it Ooh, is because that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> when yeah. I was a little girl, you know, growing up outside of Detroit, I would always see Showtime live from the Apollo on Saturday morning. <laughs> that's right. And I even wow. remember they had the dancers that came out dressed like showgirls and, you know, people that's rubbing right. the log for good luck before <laughs> going on for the talent show portion. So, um, you know, I just love the history of the Apollo Theater. I've been able to attend a couple shows and events there in the years that I lived in New York City. So just based upon the history and the romance of the building and everything that's happened there, uh, I the Apollo Theater is definitely my favorite place in Harlem. But, um, you know, I have to tell you, it's, yeah. a, it's a tough choice because there's so many wonderful institutions. And, and again, just growing up, I was always – so mesmerized by the Harlem Renaissance and all the history there. So, um, but I, I just really have always appreciated Harlem and, you know, all of the strong history, especially African-American history that has come out of the neighborhood. Yeah, mo- most definitely. So, and I think you, you said it there and you said the romance, it's the romance of the Apollo and it's the romance of Harlem that, that seems to, you know, grab people no matter, you know, where they are, whether they're in Harlem, the United States or the world. And uh, it's, it is that romance. And, you know, we're down now to our last uh, minute and a half, uh, Chelsea, and I've really enjoyed the conversations. And I know our readers and listeners have, too. How can they stay in touch with you, you know, social network, website, et cetera? Most definitely. So the most important thing I can tell you right now is reaching out to the Alzheimer's Association New York City chapter is best to do it via our helpline. It's 1-800-272-3900, and you can also reach us online at alz.org. You can find out about all of our great programming. It's all free of charge for New Yorkers, and it's a really great way to connect with other people who are dealing with the diagnosis or other family members who are helping their loved ones to move forward based upon their health care situation at the time. So 1-800-272-3900. That's fantastic, and and thank you, Chelsea. And uh, just because you've changed jobs does not mean that we will uh, discontinue uh, posting articles that will 
improve the lives of our uh, Harlem readers and listeners. So, you know, please stay in touch with us and send us content that will help our readers. We really would love that. And thank you, thank you, thank you for being on the show. My pleasure. And uh, yeah, I really love it and, and really love the work that you're doing and your commitment and passion is uh, uh, something that can't be measured. Uh, thank you again for being on the show and, and good luck going forward, Chelsea. Thank you, Danny. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, folks, uh, that was uh, Chelsea Lynn Rudder, who uh, is really doing great work, and you are to stay in contact with us. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm the helpful Southern California Honda person, and recently we've been doing random acts of helpfulness, like surprising a deserving dad with a brand new grill and helping give back to our veterans. And during the Honda Summer Spectacular event, we can help you too with a great deal on a reliable award-winning Honda, like the Accord, the 2018 North American Car of the Year. Click the dealer locator link to find a dealer near you and go to SoCalHondaDealers.com to suggest a random act of helpfulness for someone you know.